Our speaker this morning is Dr. Philip Dellinger. Um, many of you and many of us who have worked in sepsis throughout the years in critical care know him well. Um, he, he's been the author of hundreds and hundreds of publications, um, including the first three surviving sepsis guidelines going back to 2004 now. Uh, we had had the chance to have dinner with Dr. Dellinger last night, and he reminded us that he's the associate chair of the first consensus meeting in 1992 looking at definitions for sepsis. And so those have certainly undergone a lot of... Um, uh, not a lot of change over the past quarter century, but certainly a lot of application in the work that they have done and he has done with his colleagues through the Surviving Sepsis Campaign through the Society of Critical Care Medicine uh, for the past three guidelines. I think a fourth one's out next year, if I, if I recall correctly. Many, some of the other things about Dr. Dellinger is he's done many things, other things, and has been a leader throughout the rest of his career. One of, his, uh, one of the things he created early on in his career was the Fundamental Critical Care Support Course that many of you may be familiar with, very analogous to ACLS that the American Heart Association has. Um, and that is now in its fifth edition, teaching young learners, whether it's residents, nurses, uh, hospitalists, um, how to provide better critical care medicine uh, to the patients when they encounter them. Um, I first met Fell 16 years ago when he was the uh, senior uh, faculty the, for the first FCCS course that I was presenting for my residents. Um, he's co-authored, as I mentioned, hundreds of, hundreds of articles, uh, including a textbook of critical care medicine. All three of edi his editions have been on my bookshelf at one time or another uh, during the past decade. Um, he's also been the past president of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, um, has a master in the College of Critical Care Medicine, um, and also received their Lifetime Achievement Award a year ago, one of only 15 people in the nearly half century of SCCM to have received that award. Uh, he's also a wonderful teacher and the division head of critical care medicine at Cooper University. So let's give a nice warm welcome to Dr. Philip Dellinger. Thank you. So it's uh, great to be here and uh, great to run into to Jeff again. Um, after quite a few years, and uh, I, I don't know what it is about uh, the original definitions conference being 25 years ago. That's probably not a good thing, but uh, <clears throat> I was thinking as uh, you were going through your different hospital roll call, um, was reminded, you know, when Abbott, uh, I thought about, did I remember my disclosure slide? And I did, even though it has, it's been a long time since I've done anything with Abbott. Um, United, um, I'm a three million mile flyer on United <laughs> Airlines. <coughs> um, uh, District One, uh, Hunger Games. <laughs> I'm sure you hear that, right? <laughs> uh, but most importantly, Unity, and uh, Val's going to be talking. But success with sepsis performance improvement uh, is really about unity. And uh, now that we have the CMS measures, uh, we have resource support for this unit, uh, unity. Uh, I'm on a telephone conference every two weeks that I moderate. Uh, our sepsis coordinator screens all of our ICU admissions each week and scores all of our ICU admissions on the CMS measures. That's our real-time uh, practice performance improvement. Now, some of those will later be tagged by uh, our vendor for CMS audit, uh, but we try to, to look at those as close to real-time as we can, so we look at two weeks of data. and. For each one of those <clears throat> sessions, we look for system problems that we can fix. We have our physician and nurse and resident champion from the ED, uh, our physician, nurse, and fellow champion from the ICU, our hospitalist and nurse champion from the floors, our EPIC informatics person is on that call. Um, the sepsis coordinator and her boss uh, who's over a PI and we go through all the cases and sometimes it's not a systems problem uh, it's just a problem uh, with an individual and there needs to be education and we try to get that education done as close to real time uh, as possible. 
<clears throat> so I uh, don't have any uh, potential financial conflicts of interest for this talk. Uh, I have held a leadership position in the Society of Critical Care Medicine for some time. <clears throat> Uh, I've broken down my talk into, I'm going to begin talking very briefly about sepsis burden, a little more extensively about the new definitions, um, a couple of early severe sepsis management issues that are uh, of interest or controversial or where there may be <clears throat> some education that you'd be interested in and then finish with the, uh, my view of the evolution of sepsis performance improvement uh, that began in 2005 uh, with the first uh, surviving sepsis campaign, uh, sepsis bundles. The sepsis performance improvement program is about infection-induced organ dysfunction and tissue hypoperfusion. That's what we're trying to prevent, uh, and that's what we're trying to identify early and try to stop progression. The state of sepsis in the U.S., uh, Jeff covered this. Uh, I think I have a nice overlap of uh, points. Uh, In-hospital death is eight times higher uh, with severe sepsis compared to other diagnoses. And of the top five most expensive conditions treated in U.S. hospitals, uh, severe sepsis is number one, uh, $20.3 billion um, a year, 62%. Uh, uh, Medicare, this is from 2011. This is our New Jersey data uh, showing that septicemia which still gets coded out a lot, and we'll talk more about that in the definitions, uh, which haven't included septicemia uh, since before uh, 1992. So we've tried to get rid of septicemia since 1992, but it's hanging around. Uh, and influenza and pneumonia, if you think about how someone would die from influenza and pneumonia, it would, in the overwhelming majority of cases, be a septic death. This is U.S. data, uh, the most recent data from July 2015, and you can see again uh, septicemia uh, gets uh, listed as one of the, the top uh, diagnoses. And if you look at the percent change in uh, leading causes of hospital death, you can see that all the others are going down and sepsis is going up. Now, part of that is due to better identification, uh, but a lot of it's due to sicker patients and patients more likely to become septic. We've changed the ICD codes, as you're aware, you're aware to severe sepsis and septic shock. But despite that, there continues to be coding of septicemia, which we never got rid of. <clears throat> uh, a great movie, Apollo 13, Tom Hanks, uh, famous line from real life and from the movie, Houston, we have a problem. So I draw analogy to healthcare, we have a problem when it comes to sepsis. I was one of the four associate chairs when Roger Bone uh, brought together a group of academic critical care physicians to create the first consensus conference on definitions. Uh, this is the famous Venn diagram. <clears throat> what it's showing you is that there is a systemic inflammatory response syndrome uh, most people think about this as tachycardia, elevated white count, uh, elevated respiratory rate, changes in white blood cell count, the classic surge criteria, um, that may be caused by infection or other things such as trauma, burns, pancreatitis. And when it's infection, uh, we have traditionally called that sepsis. Uh, 
And when it's associated with organ dysfunction, we have called it severe sepsis. So the pyramid of the 1992 sepsis definitions, uh, which did not change much until the recent consensus conference, and still those are only recommendations, and I'm not sure how those are going <clears throat> to be adopted or not. Uh, but the original concept was that SIRS plus infection gave you sepsis, and sepsis with organ failure gave you severe sepsis, and septic shock uh, was the persistence of hypotension despite adequate intravascular volume replacement with fluids, which really equates to patients that go on vasopressors, and some people tend to think of it as patients on vasopressors. The caveat there is if you didn't adequately fluid resuscitate a patient and that patient would not have needed to be on vasopressors, then that really is not a fair characterization of that patient. This is the uh, 2001 consensus conference. Uh, I think that's a typo. I think it was published in 2002, but it could have been 2003. Things didn't change much uh, with the 2001 consensus conference. There was always uh, critics of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome uh, as being too sensitive. The old, if I run for the bus, I'll get tachycardic and tachypnic and have SIRS. <clears throat> but at the same time, um, we were trying to make it sensitive. We wanted people to be overly sensitive in thinking about does this patient have sepsis and then looking for organ dysfunction and get in early to treat. Actually, the 2001 consensus conference said, you know, we want people to think about sepsis for more things because if there's a perturbation of glucose, that might be sepsis. And there may be hypotension, but not the traditional four SERS criteria. And we want people to think about infection in that case. So they actually, despite the criticism of the SERS criteria being too sensitive, they broadened the systemic manifestations that should make one think that this could be infection and this could be infection-induced organ dysfunction, and this patient needs antibiotics. So that's the 2001. Between 2000 and 2012, uh, for probably a variety of reasons, mortality decreased. Um, I hope that part of it was due to the surviving sepsis campaign, Part of it has to do with better critical care in general, uh, with mechanical ventilation and organ support, et cetera. <clears throat> but for whatever reason, we have made progress with survival. Uh, but at the same time, the number of patients with sepsis is increasing. This was a paper published in 2015, uh, and uh, Jeff and I were, were talking about this last night, and he and I have a similar teaching style to this article. What this uh, study did, it took a huge number of patients that were identified with severe sepsis, infection-induced organ dysfunction or tissue hypoperfusion, and it showed that one in eight of those patients did not have two of the classic SERS criteria. And they, their point was one-eighth of patients with severe sepsis don't have SERS criteria. So my point would be that seven-eighths do, which is the point Jeff made, and I'm not surprised about this. Again, we've always wanted sensitivity. But we've always recognized that the great challenge uh, with sepsis is that we cannot achieve specificity. We just have to say that in 2016, 
we are handicapped by specificity because we don't have a troponin and we don't have an EKG rise and we don't have a CT or MRI that, strows, that shows stroke. And that's why despite the fact that sepsis causes more deaths, costs us more money, we have lagged far behind stroke and heart attacks and cancer for getting public awareness and getting media coverage. That's changing, but it's changing still without a specific diagnostic test for infection-induced organ dysfunction and tissue hyperperfusion, and that is uh, a great challenge. We often look back to identify severe sepsis and septic shock and not, you know, we say it could be, probably is, treated as, and then later on we decide it is. That doesn't happen that often with myocardial infarction or stroke. We don't say, let's treat a stroke, let's treat an MI, and then we'll look back and see if it really was a stroke or it really was an acute MI. For years and years, I've enrolled patients in studies for severe sepsis and septic shock. And by the time we get the patient, uh, they're already diagnosed. And we go through, and sometimes we disagree with the diagnosis, so we don't enroll them in the clinical trial. But this is a very different and challenging disease state. So these are the, the new definitions. Um, when, when people talk about the new definitions, uh, I think it's important to remember that these are the new proposed definitions. And that's what I think about. Uh, we need to remember that these are just now coming under the scrutiny of the population of performance improvement people that work with sepsis. You need to realize that three major organizations looked at these definitions and refused to sponsor the definitions, refused to endorse the definitions, including the American College of Emergency Physicians, the Infectious Disease Society of America, and the American College of Chest Physicians. And I encourage you um, to, to see the other side, and you'll see how I play this. I'm both for and against the new definitions. Um, I think eventually we will work them into something uh, that could be special. Right now there are problems, right now there's some benefit. Uh, Jeff and I uh, have a mutual friend, Steve Simonson. Uh, Steve is writing quite a bit, I think, uh, very eloquently about some of the problems with these new definitions. I really can't. Uh, people know personally that I have some issues with the new definitions, uh, but I'm too much. I'm too much a party person uh, to to be, so I can occasionally go out with a small group and point to the, both the positives and the negatives of the new definitions, which I'll do here. And it's always important to point to the future and how we may get to a place where the idea of these new definitions uh, becomes something special. In a nutshell, the new definitions that are proposed co compare to the current, so the current and the proposed. What we used to call infection, it's recommended that we still call it infection. And what we used to call sepsis, which is infection plus systemic manifestations of infection, we call infection. So that goes away. The infection plus systemic manifestations of infection in the absence of organ dysfunction or tissue hypoperfusion uh, we now doesn't have a name except infection. 
what we used to call severe sepsis becomes sepsis, and severe sepsis goes away. So it's sort of a move around. Um, what's the purpose of this? The purpose was that in, in 1991, when we met for the 1992 definitions, uh, we were on a mission to get rid of sepsis syndrome, which was just everywhere. It used a lot more than septicemia. Uh, and we succeeded. And we created severe sepsis. And after 25 years, uh, the only people that said severe sepsis uh, were the people that were academically niched in sepsis, that were into sepsis, understood sepsis, liked sepsis, talked about sepsis, knew what the purest definitions were, would say severe sepsis. The lay public, the patient advocacy groups, the media, they still said sepsis. And when I would interview on TV or to the newspaper, uh, I always use sepsis, blood poisoning, uh, because severe sepsis didn't translate. And as uh, the patient advocacy groups uh, have become so important and the media has become so important, these new, defin new proposed definitions try to create one term for sepsis-induced, for infection-induced organ dysfunction, tissue hypoperfusion, that works for the newspapers, that works for the patient advocacy groups, uh, and works for clinicians. E even I am guilty of, maybe not guilty, but checking out an ICU service and saying, you know, I've got a really bad septic patient back in bed 11. I usually don't say, I've got a really bad, severely septic patient back in bed 11. So that's one of the positives for the new definitions. The other positives is that the old definitions uh, were more good old person's definitions, good old boy's definitions. You know, they were expert opinion. They weren't based on data. Uh, they've been attempted to use data uh, for the current definitions, although in actuality the data wasn't used to create the definitions. The data was really used to get a handle on what would predict poorer outcome in patients that were already on antibiotics and for creation of Q-SOFA. The proposed new definitions uh, define sepsis as life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. Uh, organ dysfunction uh, is called an acute change of greater than two points on the SOFA score, equal to or greater than two points on the SOFA score. So if you go up two points acutely, on the SOFA score, um, and here is the SOFA score. Uh, so if you are going to try to trial run these new definitions, you'll need to become familiar with the SOFA score table. Uh, septic shock is similar to our previous definition of septic shock. Uh, hypotension persisting after adequate fluid resuscitation uh, to keep the MAP 65 or more on vasopressors. But the serum lactate uh, with the new definitions has to be measured and has to be elevated. So that's an addition to the new definitions. One of the confusing things about and I'll jump to it just in case I don't cover it with the CMS measures. And for the CMS measures, remember the, there's a table that tells you what organ dysfunction level or tissue hypoperfusion abnormality qualifies an infected patient uh, for inclusion in the CMS measures as a patient with severe sepsis. Uh, 
The reason they chose to, to add lactate uh, to the persistent hypotension is it is linked to increased mortality. Uh, they compared SIRS, SOFA, the, the load score, and something they call quick SOFA. This whole database that they looked at uh, were patients that had already been started on antibiotics. So these were all patients in this big database uh, that were presumed to have uh, infection or thought might have infection. Included patients from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign database, uh, from the Pittsburgh database, and some other databases. But SOFA was the best predictor for outcome in a patient already on antibiotics for infection. Loads was very similar, another score. And quick SOFA actually performed pretty good for predicting outcome. And quick SOFA had an advantage in that it was easy to calculate. It's any altered mental status, any uh, Glasgow coma score less than 15, uh, a respiratory rate greater than 22, and a systolic, uh, a low systolic blood pressure, and that's reversed. That should be systolic blood pressure uh, equal to or less than 100. In patients with an infection, a quick SOFA score equal to or greater than two is associated with higher mortality and prolonged ICU stay. I, I have a little bit of an issue with this. Uh, if, if someone said, uh, Dr. Dellinger, do you think if I have a patient and they have two of these three altered mental status, fast respiratory rate and low blood pressure, and I don't have a good reason why I should think of infection uh, or and maybe they're going to do poorly and I really need to do a lot of stuff like s look for source control, uh, look and see what the lactate is, et cetera, et cetera. I'd say, yeah. However, uh, the, the, Q so, the quick SOFA from the uh, accompanying article with the definitions that showed uh, how this database was worked uh, did not use this as any type of predictor of having severe sepsis. It was not used as, it has not been validated as any type of screening tool for severe sepsis. It's only been validated for inpatients that are on antibiotics because someone thinks they're infected, that having two out of three of those is predictive of having a complicated outcome. To me, that's a far cry than what we're doing with our performance improvement programs, which is, here's SIRS, here's an organ dysfunction, do I know what's causing it? Mm, I'm not sure. Am I thinking about infection? Uh, should I start empiric antibiotics? Uh, or in a patient that's on antibiotics that has systemic manifestations but you haven't identified organ dysfunction, should I screen for organ dysfunction to see if I have severe sepsis? You could use quick sofa for that latter. Uh, if you have a patient on antibiotics and they have two or three quick SOFA and you weren't already going to screen for organ dysfunction, that would fit with how they did the data analysis. Let me, uh, their, little Venn, their little flow diagram, uh, which isn't validated, uh, would be if you have a patient with suspected infection, what is the quick sofa? If it's elevated, assess for evidence of organ dysfunction. Uh, and if they have it, uh, you know, that could be sepsis. So if you have a patient with suspected infection, quick sofa equal to or greater than two, uh, look for organ dysfunction. If they don't have a quick sofa of at least two or the three still say 
am I concerned about sepsis-induced organ dysfunction if I am, I'm going to order screening tests. It, it really isn't a big change probably from what we're currently doing. Uh, we have a lot of uh, EPIC alarms. Uh, we also have something called MedCPU. Uh, SERS is heavily built in uh, to all of our alarms. Uh, SERS is something that the nurses on our hospital floors understand and can look for. Um, it, it seems to work for our alarms. It works for our hospital floors. I can't imagine uh, someone not approaching a patient that may be at risk for severe sepsis and not thinking about sep the old sepsis in their brain. I think we're, we're still going to have to use it, whether we write it down on paper or not, we're going to have to think about systemic manifestations of infection, any systemic manifestation of infection as being important and being a potential trigger for looking for organ dysfunction or infection if it's not already being treated. I'm going to shift gears now and um, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the the 2012 or 2013 guideline uh, recommendations that there's new literature uh, or that have remained somewhat controversial uh, since the previous guidelines as we go into what will be probably the 2017 uh, new guidelines. Uh, most of you know there are 30 international organizations that uh, sponsored the previous guidelines. Um, th there will be no shift uh, on the importance uh, of antibiotics in severe sepsis and septic shock. There have been a couple of little Flickr articles that have been published. You know, anytime there, there's a new paradigm, uh, there are always academic physicians that are trying to find data uh, that would tend to maybe tarnish a little bit recommendations like the importance of early antibiotics. So there have been a couple of those published. You know, there's an article uh, published in the ED for that particular database uh, that as long as antibiotics were started prior to the onset of septic shock in the ED, uh, that the time to antibiotics did not make a statistically significant difference in that data set. But at the same time, there are more and more articles being published that show it does. So the, the strong consensus is that um, probably the thing that has driven down mortality more so than anything else is early identification and early antibiotics. So this is the old recommendation. I suspect the new recommendation is going to be stated very similarly. Uh, this is a, a cartoon that uh, looks at what happens in septic shock. You know, why are these patients such a challenge? Um, they're, they're leaking uh, like sieves, some of them, but there's a variable degree of leak, capillary leak. And there's also venodilatation. And a combination of venodilatation and leakage out of the capillaries drops intravascular volume, so you don't get as much blood return back to the heart. That's why these patients need fluid resuscitation. And if they've got a lot of venodilatation and they've got a lot of capillary leak, they need a lot of fluid resuscitation. And if you give two liters of fluid and then you start vasopressors and they go to high vasopressors and you keep giving fluids and then you put pressure bags on three liters of LR and you run them in and you bring the norepi dose down from 35 down to 8 and then you back off on the fluids and it starts the, the, the norepinephrine requirements start going right back up. 
that tells you that patient has a big leak. Uh, so that patient is leaking fluid out as you're putting it in. Sometimes you don't see it uh, for 18, 24 hours uh, before you begin to see all that edema and the marshmallow people. Uh, but if you have end-stage renal disease on dialysis and uric, or you have chronic cardiomyopathy with a 20% ejection fraction, and you get the same dose of sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock, that someone that didn't have any of those conditions you'll get the same amount of leak, the same amount of venodilatation, you'll have the same decrease in intravascular volume, and you'll have the same need for fluids. So having end-stage renal disease on dialysis should not alter your need for intravascular volume fluid replacement, and the amount should be the same. It's just overshoot is a problem. If you overshoot in most of our patients with septic shock that haven't gone into acute renal failure, they'll start peeing out that extra fluid that you've loaded. And my approach to those patients is to target the 30 mLs per kg, just like I would in anybody else. But instead of in a 35-year-old previously healthy person, where I've got pressure bags around three lead, got three liters of LR up. I got two running with pressure bags. I'm running it in. I know I'm going to give three liters uh, before I even reassess. These patients, you use a small bolus approach. You do two fit. The nurse should do 250. Look at the SAT. 250. Look at the SAT. 250, look at the SAT, until you hit that 30 ml per kg target. Uh, because the only downside of fluid resuscitation, well, there are two. The main downside is hypoxemia. And if you're not producing hypoxemia, there's no downside to fluids, unless it's intra-abdominal compartment syndrome, which is rare, uh, but something to think about. Uh, so nothing irrit irritates me more, and I rarely get irritated. Uh, then going in and going to an ICU bed early in the morning and looking at a severely under-resuscitated septic shock patient that needed five times more fluids than what they got that's on 35 of norepinephrine and mechanically ventilated on 30% uh, or 0.21 FiO2. Because there's a patient that you had all the safety net in the world to be more aggressive with fluid resuscitation. Another point about the 30 mLs per kg. Uh, oh, and the cardiomyopathy. Uh, you know, Val and I talked about this last night, which is these patients that have cardiomyopathy. Uh, I used to, I can remember vividly when it finally I had the the uh, understood I finally understood uh, when I had a patient that was admitted with severe cardiomyopathy and they came in with chest pain and they went to the calf lab and they had an a left ventricular end diastolic pressure valve what's a normal left ventricular end diastolic pressure yeah. Eight? Yeah. So instead of having an eight, uh, they had a 30 or 32 or something. So w what that means is that their left atrial pressure was four times higher than normal, and their pulmonary capillary pressure was four times higher than normal. Uh, but their chest X-ray was clear, and their oxygenation was normal. And I said, how can that be? You know, how can that be? And a cardiologist explained to me that if you slowly over years go into worsen and worsening cardiomyopathy, that we have an incredible 
reserve with our lymphatic drainage so that we're able to increase our lymphatic drainage of pumping out fluid from the lung interstitium uh, to 10, 20 fold. So that's how they can run high LV EDPs and high pulmonary capillary pressures. At the same time, with that crappy ventricle, they've stretched it more and more so that they, get it, they take advantage of Starling's equation, which is if you've got crappy heart muscle, the more you stretch it, the more intensely it contracts. So they actually benefit from having that high pressure and that high stretch, which is why they need the fluids back. Uh, you just need to be careful in how you give it back. Same rules, small bolus, sat, small bolus, sat, uh, is, is how you need to go. And the reason I'm sitting on this slide is because there's some things I'm not sure I put in that's important to tell you. And uh, I, this slide works for talking about them, so I'm just going to sit here. If it comes up later, we'll say we've already talked about that. I believe that you save lives with early aggressive fluid resuscitation in septic shock patients, that people that would have died, and then as they get better, as you kill the bacteria, the toxins go away, the pro-inflammatory, pro-coagulant process goes away, you've cleaned up their source control, you don't have this toxic systemic environment, the pulmonary capillary that we're producing this leak heal, and now all that fluid that you use to save that patient's life a large component of that is all out in the body, including the organs, and it's working against you. And we all know that, that many patients who may have been 20 liters up over the first three days of their septic shock experience will all of a sudden begin to autodiurese. And what we'll see is we get a 750 in five, six liter out day, and then another 750 in, five, six liter out. That's because the capillary uh, uh, endothelium has healed. Starling forces come back into play. You've got that high interstitial pressure because of all that fluid, so it forces it back in and you pee it out. If you look at large databases, it is no surprise that the septic shock patients that have the highest eye input to output ratios have the worst outcome. Some people have had the gall to imply, instead of saying maybe we're giving these patients too much fluid, which I'm willing to say because I think there are some patients we're giving too much fluid, um, they're saying that the fluid is killing the patient uh, because of this high I to O ratio in the association with mortality. But really, those patients are sicker. So that patient I described, the guy that's trying to die from cardiovascular collapse, that I'm putting the pressure bags in, and as soon as I back off, the blood pressure goes down here. Is that patient going to have a high to I to O ratio? You bet. Um, is the fluid killing him? I don't think so. Uh, the degree of capillary leak and venodilatation is what's putting that patient at risk. Now, having said that, I am sure that for every patient, there's a right mix of vasopressor dose to achieve the MAP and fluids to achieve the MAP because if you can achieve the right MAP with this much vasopressors and this much fluid to get the sweet pot spot for that patient so you don't get as much leak, we just don't know what that is. Um, if people asked last night, you know, where did the 20 mLs per kg come from in the 2004 performance improvement program? 
uh, where did the 20 mLs come from in the 2005 first sepsis performance improvement program? And it was just pure expert opinion. Uh, the majority of people thought that patients needed more than 20. But we felt like we didn't want to set the bar too high. That's why the original bundles had 20. And then more recently, it's gone to 30. What about... Uh, what type of crystalloid? We recommend 30 mLs per kg crystalloid. Uh, what about what type? Uh, here's the recommendation for the 30 mL. Uh, a portion of this may be albumin equivalent. For the CMS measures, it has to be crystalloid. Um, back with the sepsis bundles, we had a table so that the person that was scoring performance with the surviving sepsis campaign bundles as to fluid resuscitation could convert albumin to crystalloid to give credit. That still exists here, but not in the CMS measures. Uh, we recommend the use of albumin in the fluid resuscitation of severe sepsis and septic shock when patients require substantial amounts of crystalloids. That scenario that I painted of we're up to three or four bags of LR running in rapidly or normal saline, and every time we back off, the vasopressor requirements go up, that patient uh, I would start giving albumin to when you're giving that much crystalloids. And you're seeing that response when you back off the fluids, the vasopressor requirements go up. Uh, and the first time that uh, anyone ever thought about giving a crystalloid type fluid to a patient in shock uh, was during the blue cholera pandemic in Paris. Uh, it was published in 1831. The idea of putting a needle uh, or some type of cannula-like device into a vein and giving fluids because people were dying left and right due to cardiovascular collapse, due to intravascular volume depletion, due to diarrhea. It was uh, in the 1880s uh, that someone uh, named Sidney Ringer uh, created Ringer Solution. Uh, Hartog Hamburger created normal saline in uh, 1896. And Hartman created Hartman Solution in 1930s. Hartman Solution, uh, when it was created in the 1930s, was an attempt to take a crystalloid and lower the chloride to something similar to what was in plasma and to add a buffer. Acetate was what was added as a buffer. If you look at the various choices of crystalloid, we have normal saline, uh, which is anything but normal. Uh, normal saline is Abby normal. What movie was that from? <laughs> the, man, the Man with Two Brains? Was that? Yeah, anyway. So uh, the, the, if, if you assume a, a, a normal sodium is 145 and a normal chloride is 110 or something, 108, um, you can see that the sodium in normal saline is eh, okay compared to normal, but the chloride is, is very, very high compared to normal. Um, and what happens if if you take a if you have a a bucket uh, that holds five liters of let's say plasma, um, but you could just make it any fluid. Let's just make it all uh, crystalloid. So you've got three liters of crystalloid in this five liter bucket, and it's the sodium and chloride that's in plasma. So let's make it 145 and 108 or whatever, which means now I can't do any calculations. So, but, and then we take normal saline. 
which has 154 and 154. And we pour two liters of that normal saline with this three liters of what is a, rela a relationship of sodium and chloride like blood. What's going to happen is the sodium is not going to change much. It may go up just a little bit. But that chloride is going to go up a lot because you put a high chloride into a lo much lower chloride. So what's going to happen is the difference between the sodium and chloride is going to get narrower and narrower. And that's what happens when you give a lot of normal saline as a resuscitation fluid. You bring the difference between sodium and chloride closer. And as it turns out, the dissociation of free water, the H2O into H+, plus, which is the acid in the blood, is determined by the relationship of the major strong cation, which is sodium, and the major strong anion, which is chloride. And if you narrow that difference, it increases the dissociation of free water, creates more H+, plus, but you, and you don't measure it in the anion gap. So it creates a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. And we, we notice it a lot. We, we notice it most frequently when we resuscitate a severe DKA patient. We give tons of normal saline. And uh, the gap's gone. Uh, the serum beta hydroxybutyrate is gone. Uh, and we look at our bicarb and it's 18 or 17 or 16. So even though we've got rid of the ketoacidosis, there's a lingering non-anion gap metabolic acidosis from all that normal saline. Is that important? Uh, we don't know. Uh, but clearly, you can give what's called balanced crystalloid, such as lactated ringers or Hartmann's or ringers acetate or plasmolite, which is not typically given because it's expensive. But you can give a balanced solution that doesn't produce that non-anion gap uh, metabolic acidosis. So some people, including me, as we await this huge trial that's being done in Australasia comparing normal saline and uh, either Hartman's or Ringer's uh, to see if it does make a difference I don't think LR is going to make my patient worse, so I tend to switch over to LR uh, more often than I used to. These are just some studies uh, that are published uh, that show some associations of normal saline enhanced fluids uh, producing worse outcome compared to balanced crystalloid. Uh, some units have switched from normal saline, which is an unbalanced crystalloid, uh, to ringers, uh, and shown that the mortality in this year compared to the, the past year is better. Uh, some studies have shown increased renal replacement therapy um, in, in times when you were using uh, normal saline-based. Other studies have not. So is it okay to use normal saline? Yes, there's no evidence-based medicine at this point in time that would steer you away from it. I'm curious, are we seeing um, more ringers and less normal saline in Minneapolis? Still predominantly normal saline? It may prove that it doesn't make a difference. Uh, we recommend a mean arterial pressure of 65. This is a study uh, published in 2014, um, comparing maintaining mean arterial pressure, uh, trying to maintain it 65 to 75 in sep 65 to 70 in septic shock with norepinephrine versus 80 to 85, and you can see they achieved a nice separation in the two groups. You can also see that nurses tend to prefer to titrate a little higher than what the target is as opposed to a little lower. So they actually both were up higher uh, 
than they were supposed to be based on the research study. And there was absolutely no difference between the two groups, which confirmed some old data. Um, but it was interesting that uh, with the history of hypertension, the higher target blood pressure group had a lower incidence of acute kidney injury and dialysis requirements. Subgroup analysis doesn't prove anything. Um, may make some people now run the MAP a little higher in patients with chronic hypertension. Makes sense. Uh, choice of vasopressor um, during septic shock. Um, over half the patients have a decrease in ejection fraction uh, so that if you look at how the ventricle looks before contraction and after contraction, you see the marked decrease in contractility. This is a severe example that I'm showing you here uh, that you get recovery. But if you have a patient that you have fluid resuscitated, you believe you've achieved your intravascular volume target, and they're still hypotensive, it's a combination in most patients of vasodilatation and decreased contractility, which is why we recommend combined inotrope vasopressors. Uh, Dopamine and norepinephrine are both uh, combined inotrope vasopressors. Uh, there's more and more data that norepinephrine uh, performs better as far as outcome than dopamine in pretty much all forms of shock. Um, that is, is uh, thought to be related to dopamine tendency to drive arrhythmias. This is the way I think about it. Uh, everybody gets started on norepinephrine. Everybody gets 30 mLs per kg of fluid. Um, and then if I can't achieve my MAP target um, with norepinephrine, uh, I tend to add low-dose vasopressin uh, at 0.03. Uh, but you could add epinephrine and either run both norepinephrine and epinephrine together or even replace it with epinephrine. And the recommendation is that you do not use dopamine to treat septic shock unless you have sinus bradycardia. And you do not use phenylephrine unless you're measuring cardiac output and you know it's high. Or if you're getting serious tachyarrhythmias with norepinephrine, then you would switch to phenylephrine, which should not drive any arrhythmias. How much norepinephrine do you use? Let's see some hands. Now for the nurses and the, the quality people, it's sort of like just what you see in the chart or what you, you see used on your patient. So, okay. Uh, do I hear 30? Nobody uses up to 30 of norepi? Do I hear 40? Now, if you're going to raise your hand on 40, you should have raised it on 30. <laughs> okay. Do, do I hear 50? Do I hear 60? Do I hear 70? You know, actually, if this was a real auction, you wouldn't have to raise your hand again unless somebody else raised their hand. So you're, you, you already have it. I think you, you had it at 50. Um, so... There's, there's no right answer uh, to this. Uh, I used to sort of switch over and add something around 30 or 40. Uh, it's not unusual for me to go to 50, 60, 70. Um, a lot of this has come from being on panels with my European colleagues uh, and some who I highly respect. You know, you'll hear maxed out on norepinephrine, there really is no such thing. No one's ever shown that 60 of norepi is problematic or 70. These patients are probably just poorly responsive to norepinephrine. So if, if you were producing serious squeeze injury, uh, then the blood pressure would be going up, and it's not. Steroids and se I tried to, I, I looked on uh, Google image, I looked for something ethereal. Did I sort of achieve it here with this, sort of an ethereal look? So that's what I think. I, the term, use steroids when the patient remains hemodynamically unstable despite 
intravascular volume replacement and vasopressors. The purists would only use steroids if you can't get the blood pressure up. Um, I think everybody would use steroids if you can't get the blood pressure up. I tend to use steroids if I'm on multiple pressors or very high dose norepinephrine. Um, one thing we know for sure, it does get patients out of septic shock sooner. We just have not been able to prove that it alters outcome. Uh, and we recommend normalizing lactate. Uh, and let's finish. I want to leave some time for questions. I think we have till 10. So if I can leave 15 minutes for discussion, that, that would work. So guidelines are not enough. Um, we learned a long time ago, it's now accepted science, uh, that just publishing a great work of, of carefully thought out guidelines, recommendations, doesn't move behavior at bedside much at all. And when it does move it, and I may be getting into some of Val's stuff, but when it, when it does move it, uh, it's a slow process, and it's not very satisfactory for those of us that would like to see the needle move quicker. In order to, to change behavior, you need protocols, you need order sets, you need dot phrases, and most importantly, you need audit and feedback. You need to tell groups of doctors how they're performing, and you need to tell individual doctors how they're performing. Because at the onset, they're all doing fine from, from their standpoint. Um, we uh, recommended uh, every hospital have er, uh, early screening and performance improvement programs in place for sepsis in the 2012 guidelines. Uh, going back to 2004, um, we had promised that not only would we create guidelines, but we would decrease mortality of severe sepsis and septic shock worldwide by 20%. You know, it's sort of like the Donald Trump campaign. Um, but, you know, and then we, we finished the guidelines. And, and I say that in neither a positive nor negative way. I hope it came across that way. But because I'm drawing a corollary to the surviving sepsis campaign. So now we had these guidelines out and everybody was saying, wow, what a great job with these guidelines. Okay, now we're ready to see mortality decrease by 20%. And we did not have a clue. We had no plan, absolutely no plan. And we were lucky in that we were approached by the Institute uh, for Healthcare Improvement, the IHI, that wanted to partner with us and wanted to help create sepsis bundles because they were the bundles people. And so we created sepsis bundles and uh, you know we chose them based on things we thought weren't being done and might make a difference. And uh, we created uh, six and 24 hour bundles that uh, continued up until the 20, you know, shortly after the 2012 guidelines, uh, and now we have new bundles um, that are not going to be used uh, because they've changed with some publications, but I'm getting ahead of myself uh, with the story. So I, and when I say I'm getting ahead of myself in the story, that reminded me of Princess Bride. I'm, you remember when, you remember when uh, the grandfather was reading the book and he'd say, well, what was the, the guy, what was the guy's name? Played Columbo, Peter Falk was reading the book. It's a great movie. For you younger people that have not seen Princess Bride, uh, I would highly encourage you to see it because it is definitely not dated and uh, you will definitely enjoy it. But, okay, so I was getting ahead of myself like Peter Falk did reading the book. Um, so we did the six and 24 hour bundles. Uh, in 2008, nothing really changed. So we continued on uh, with the same six and 24 hour bundles. Uh, we published, um, I was a senior author on this patient and uh, 
you know, uh, Jeff and I were talking, you, know, you would probably gotten equal or perhaps more out of having Krista Shore here. Uh, she's been the lead nurse uh, with the surviving sepsis campaign since uh, 2005. Uh, but this is very much uh, a nursing and physician and pharmacy uh, program uh, in order to make this work. And uh, I'm, I didn't talk um, about the hospital floors initiative. Uh, we have a paper uh, under review in annals, which represents a three-year performance improvement effort on early identification and treatment of severe sepsis uh, on the hospital floors or wards or medical surgical units or whatever is politically correct here in Minneapolis um, with the we started the uh, every patient, every shift, every day. That was our, we started that for the hospital floors program. Now someone has added everywhere, which makes sense to encompass the whole hospital. Uh, but, but I think you'll see that we had some very positive results uh, from this program. And this is nurse screening. This is a nurse driven program. Uh, that at many hospitals included uh, the ability for nurses to do diagnostic testing. Uh, they could do everything but uh, order antibiotics, but they were able to do diagnostic testing. We published uh, the result uh, from, I think, uh, 30,000 patients, maybe over 7.5 years internationally in this volunteer program where hospitals instituted these surviving sepsis campaign bundles at their own hospital and they tracked performance uh, and they tracked outcome and what we were able to show at these hospitals that when you compared the first quarter they were in to the second to the third to the fourth fifth six seven that mortality when you put these hospitals together went progressively down uh, from 37% uh, to 26%. And this was a lot of patients. Then we published the 2012 guidelines. Um, by that time, we, the, 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 we said let's, we did away with the 24-hour bundle, got rid of consider APC, consider steroids, um, you know, measure lactate, blood cultures, antibiotics, 30 ml kg fluid, and then um, MAP65. We were getting a lot of pushback on CVP and SCVO2 targets, uh, so what we did is we said, well, we're not going to give a target, but at least measure them because patients will have a central line in on vasopressors, most patients. So at least measure them. That was going to be the bundle. Uh, and then these two papers came out, uh, the uh, process and ARISE trial uh, that showed that you did not have to use a central venous catheter and CVP and SCVO2 to successfully resuscitate a septic shock patient. You could do it, and it was just as good as not doing it, but it wasn't any better than not doing it if you just used academic center in a clinical trial awareness of severe of septic shock uh, that you could you could do it without those measurements so the national quality forum had already adopted the surviving sepsis campaign three and six hour bundle and it was sort of like a whoops uh, the National Quality Forum said, we've already teed these up for CMS, and now these articles came out. So here's how they handled it on their website. They said, NQF has in endorsed changes to an element of a sepsis measure, the severe sepsis septic shock management, uh, that makes the use of a central venous catheter to monitor blood oxygen pressure le levels optional instead of required. Then to everyone's surprise, um, including those of us in the surviving sepsis campaign, uh, 
Um, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the CMS were publishing sepsis measures with mandated collection in October. Totally surprise for us. So here's where we are. The uh, SEP1 um, exclusion criteria are greater than 18, length of stay greater than 120, refusal of care, transfers from outside facility, uh, comfort care early uh, or dying early. And the way this works, most of, a lot of you that are in high level here know that you have a vendor that's going to pull severe sepsis, septic shock, ICD-10 codes and then give those charts to somebody at the hospital that has an internal auditor with knowledge of sepsis. They go in, make sure that it, it matches the sepsis screening tool, which is the same as the sepsis screening tool for the surviving sepsis campaign. And if it does, then they, they score the metrics and you either pass or fail, and it's an all pass. You have to get all of them to pass. And a, a lot of those severe sepsis septic shock codes do not meet the uh, CMS uh, SSA screening criteria. Three hours, six hour clock, um, first three hours for patients with severe sepsis, first six hours for patients with septic shock. For severe sepsis, it's different from the surviving sepsis campaign. It used to be for surviving sepsis, sepsis campaign that if you were admitted from the ED uh, with uh, severe sepsis or septic shock, it was triage time, was time zero for meeting the uh, time requirements for the metrics. Now it's when the chart flashes this patient has severe sepsis. So the chart gives you the infection plus the organ dysfunction or the tissue hypoperfusion abnormality. That's when time zero. So it's, it's almost never going to be triage. It could be triage if someone shows up with a triage vitals of 103 temp uh, and a blood pressure of 70 systolic and a big swollen right arm with cellulitis. Otherwise, it's almost always going to be sometime later in the ED. And it also is it's when a physician... Um, writes um, or a licensed independent provider writes that they, the patient has sep severe sepsis, septic shock, or presumed, uh, or we're going to treat, whatever, uh, then they don't have to have the requirement. Uh, for the three hour severe sepsis, um, it's uh, the same as always blood cultures, antibiotics, lactate. Um, and then one of the severe sepsis metrics is actually outside the three hours, and that's the repeat lactate if the lactate is elevated. Um, here are the organ dysfunctions. Uh, you also, the SERS criteria are still here. So the SERS criteria persist with the CMS measures. Uh, documented suspecting infection, surge criteria, uh, organ dysfunction, or somebody writes that they believe or are sure or think this patient has severe sepsis. Septic shock. Um, uh, if they fail the severe sepsis, you don't even need to go further for the special septic shock measures. If you fail severe sepsis, you fail septic shock. Um, fluid 30 mLs per kg. Um, it's, the way that is is curious. Uh, there is no requirement uh, to give 30 mLs per kg, uh, but you can only do the reassessment for septic shock after the 30 mLs per kg, and you fail if you don't do the reassessment. Uh, so if you don't give the 30 mLs per kg, you fail because you don't qualify for the reassessment and you fail. And the, um, within one hour of getting the 30 mLs of kg of fluid in, uh, you have to get the MAP up to 65 with pressor. Uh, 
And if there's persistent hypotension after the 30 mLs per kg or the lactate is equal to or greater than four, you have to do this curious reassessment, the shock reassessment after the 30 mLs or fluid are in. If you give 30 mLs and the blood pressure normalizes and the lactate's not four or more, you don't have to do the reassessment. But if they go on vasopressors or the lactate's four or more, you have to do the reassessment. And the reassessment is either a focused uh, physical exam uh, that includes uh, vital signs, and you have to have all of them, uh, cardiopulmonary exam, heart and lung, capillary refill exam, um, peripheral pulse, and skin eval. If you do that, that's all you need to do. But if you elect not to do that, which doesn't make sense because that's the easiest thing to do. Uh, then you have to do two of the hemodynamics, um, either CVP and SCVO2, uh, which is the easiest to do if you're not going to do the physical exam um, if you have a central line in. Although if they're in the ED, they may not transduce, so maybe that doesn't become real easy. But they have a central line in, so you can always send a venous gas. And now you still have one more thing because you're not transducing in the ED. So now you either need to do a bedside heart and inferior vena cava ultrasound, or you need to do a passive leg raise or a fluid bolus and have some way of tracking cardiac output to say that it either did nothing or it got better or it got worse because it got worse and you document it got worse that's fine too because you're not there there's these are process measures you know they're not targets um, so I understand y'all use NECOM here primarily um, you some places use the Vigileo which you can get set up fairly quick um, Lidco and uh, Pico take longer to get set up PA catheters are really um, you know, difficult, but it's supposed to be looking at response to flow, which is cardiac output. Um, how many people with septic shock, if you or your loved one had septic shock, would want to be reassessed by a licensed independent practitioner after you got 30 mLs per kg of fluid? How many would not? How many would choose not to be reassessed? Okay, so we're all agreeing there's nothing wrong with this reassessment, right? It's just what we're being asked to do. And I've got like one minute left. I, I'll just say that Will Shoemaker, who's one of the founding fathers, um, said that we believe that almost any reasonable plan is crit in critical care is better than no plan at all. So whether you don't like our current plan or not, um, it's there because there is no evidence-based medicine to tell us what the right plan is. So if you believe in reassessment, there's no data to tell you what's the right reassessment, then you've got to make something up, right? So um, there's good data that a modeling score predicts survival in septic shock, so let's not argue about skin. Skin makes sense. Um, there's capillary refill time expiration during septic shock. There's science about that, so that makes sense. So there's science. You know, people that say they do that in kids, uh, you know, why are we doing it? It's not true. Uh, we don't know what the target should be, what the response should be, how we should do it necessarily, but we know that uh, it is abnormal and important. And we know there's data that it's been used to target therapy. And yes, this list, this pick list, is apples and oranges. Some of these relate to intravascular volume and not to tissue perfusion. Some relate to tissue perfusion and not intravascular volume, and some to both. So why you're allowed to pick two from apples and oranges really doesn't make sense. And hopefully, as we see data come in, this will be clarified. And, and I look at this as a work in progress. You know, this is like alpha-beta testing. Um, we may be embarrassed uh, when our data get compared to another hospital, but if we are, it just means that that other hospital is doing a better job uh, with these unvalidated measures than we are. 
It will never be pay for performance uh, until it gets validated. Uh, and that could happen two to three years, but we're not there now. Uh, just a couple comments about these measures. A lot of people uh, are, are finding disfavor with the CVP. Uh, it's a real measurement. Um, we do a terrible job at many units on zeroing it to the flebostatic axis to the left atrium. Uh, we do a terrible job in many units about measuring it at end expiration and knowing what that is. So it, it's only fair to the CVP that we measure it accurately. So let's be fair to the CVP. It is a real measurement. We do a lot of ultrasound. A uh, patient needs to be mechanically ventilated to really make sense of the inferior vena cava in most circumstances. I, I really get a, a lot of information out of looking at what the heart's doing. Um, passive leg raising, um, fluid challenge. Uh, greater than 15% increase with 500 mO bolus tells you that, uh, that they're fluid responsive. But again, for CMS measures, um, they don't have to be fluid responsive. Uh, your measurement doesn't have to be accurate. I would hope it would be, but doesn't have to be. Um, you need to be measuring stroke volume. And I'll finish. When, when you look at the process and the ARISE trial, um, a lot of people say, well, what, what do those trials make you think of? And people will say, well, we don't have to use CVP and SCVO2 to successfully resuscitate a patient. I worry about that, by the way, uh, at community hospitals uh, because all these studies uh, were in patients uh, at larger institutions that were really focused on severe sepsis performance improvement program. But, you know, to me, uh, this was incredible. This was unbelievable. Uh, when you look at the process and ARISE trial, um, they were enrolling these patients in the clinical trial less than two hours from detection of shock, uh, 2.8 hours medium from presentation to the ED. So this, these were the poster child studies for early identification. 75% uh, of patients had already received antibiotics before they were identified that they could be enrolled in the trial. Antibiotic 70 minutes median from presentation to the ED. 1,500 patients, and the median was 70 minutes to get antibiotics in. And before they could even consider how they were going to, to give fluids, uh, they had already gotten two to 2.5 liters of fluids. So, to save lives, early identification, early antibiotics, and early fluid resuscitation. What's, what do the CMS measures lack from this golden triad of saving lives? Early identification has nothing to do with early identification, the CMS measures. The database that was used for the SEP3 definitions, what is it lacking? Early antibiotics. The, by definition, you weren't even in the database until you had already been given antibiotics. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I saved about eight minutes instead of 15, but thank you very, thank you very much.